Holy guacamole, the devs have been busy. Darktable 3.2 is now out, and with it comes two brand new modules, a couple of other new features, and a whole bunch of tweaks. And in this video, we're going to have a look at all of that. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 66 of Understanding Darktable. Yes, you can probably hear I've got a little bit of a head cold. I'm hoping that it's not anything more severe than that. I did go and get tested yesterday, but I'm still waiting on results. Here in Australia, we're looking at around about 72 hours to get our results back. Uh, so hopefully, maybe by tomorrow night or Monday morning, I'll know. Uh, but anyway, I think it's just a head cold. So version 3.2 of Darktable. Who would have thought? It's August. In a year when everything else has gone horribly wrong, we are being blessed with not one but two major releases of Darktable this year. Normally, it's just Christmas Day. Uh, this year, we're getting this release, 3.2, in August, and then 3.4 on Christmas Day. Uh, and the reason behind that, as I understand it, was simply because there was just so much good stuff happening on the development side that uh, the the developers thought that it warranted an extra major release mid-year, kind of mid-year, yeah. So, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Where to start? Well, uh, allegedly, there's a whole bunch of speed improvements. There's some graphical changes, not major, just sort of prettying it up a bit with regards fonts and, yeah, just layout of bits and pieces. Um, I have handwritten, believe it or not, seven pages of notes here of stuff I'm going to cover in this video. Uh, and the reason I do it handwritten is because I just find it gets in here a little bit better. Okay, so there is a newly designed preferences box, which we'll look at in just a minute. Uh, if you remember the preferences from anything up to version 2.6, it was just a mess. Uh, there was really no consistency to the way it was laid out. With version 3, which came out Christmas Day 2019, the preferences got a, a good overhaul and everything was put under category headings for light table, dark room, etc., etc. And that was a major step forward. But what we've got now with 3.2 is so much nicer. Before we jump into that, one thing that I did want to mention about the light table view, uh, and for this I need something with more images, so I'm just going to jump over to my personal projects collection, uh, and that is that the file manager view and the zoomable light table view now support 25 images per row. That used to be 21. You might go, well, that's no big deal. It's only another four icons per row. Yeah, but that, that adds up. It means less scrolling. Uh, and I think the reasoning behind that is simply that the devs recognise that more and more people are moving to 4K displays. And if you have a 4K display, it would probably make sense to be able to see more thumbnails per row. So, yeah, I'm, I liked that. I, th I thought that was good. Okay, let me just jump back to this collection. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering about all the skulls, it's because I've removed a whole bunch of images from the hard drive because they're backed up elsewhere, but the XMP files are still there. So when I imported them into this build, oh, that's something I haven't addressed. I'm not on 3.2. As you will see up here in the top left-hand corner, this is a 3.1.0 build 2483. Now, as I understand it, this was only one or two builds away from the end of the development cycle. And in my researching and preparing to shoot this video, I didn't find anything that was listed in the documentation that was not in this build. So to the best of my knowledge, everything's there. Hopefully all that happened after this build came out was just bug squashing. So I've put together these four images just from previous shoots that I've done, which I will use for this video. The first thing that I wanted to mention is this 
star icon, which always was just turn on or off this metadata which appears on the bottom of your thumbnails, that is no longer just a simple on-off toggle. You are going to love this. Check it out. So let's go no overlays just to begin with. So as you would imagine, no metadata appears whatsoever over those images when you have no overlays selected. Overlays on mouse hover. As you would expect, when you hover your mouse over, you will get basic information, which is essentially just the star rating when you are at this particular thumbnail size. So we should probably address that. There is now a paradigm where there are three recognized thumbnail sizes for the light table and presumably also for the zoomable, um, what do they call it? Yeah, the zoomable light table and the file manager. And they are, for want of a better term, I'll call them small, medium and large. And you can alter in the preferences dialog box, which we'll look at later, uh, where the breakpoints are for what's considered small, what's considered medium and what's considered large. At the moment, this is what is considered a medium-sized thumbnail. So when I mouse over, I just get the star rating. If I go to the next option, which is extended overlays on mouse hover, instead of only getting the star rating, I also get the file name and extension, the shutter speed, the aperture, the focal length, and the ISO. And that particular group of information or that set of data, again, that can be customized in the preferences dialog, which we'll look at later. All right, so because I've got it on mouse hover, I only see it on the image that I'm hovered over at any given point in time. Next one, permanent overlays. So that switches on just the star rating plus the file type, which in my case is alpha raw because I shoot Sony and the grouping information and whatever the other icon is, I can't remember now. Oh, the history stack, of course. So that information appears permanently on all images. You don't need to mouse over. It's just always there. Next option is permanent extended overlays. So if we turn that on, we now get that extra information of the file name and its extension and all of the shoot metadata as well. And it's there permanently. We don't need to mouse over. Next up, permanent overlays extended on mouse hover. So now we get basic metadata all of the time and extended metadata when we mouse over the thumbnail like so. Nice. And then finally, overlays block on mouse hover during number of seconds and the default is three. So if we click that, what it means is that when we mouse over an image, we will get this block overlay of metadata for three seconds and then it will disappear as you saw. So we mouse over wait three seconds, and it goes. Now, what I did notice is that if your mouse is actually on top of the metadata block, it will stay there. It doesn't disappear after three seconds, as you can see. It's still there. Are you going? No, you're not going. All right, so if you have moused over that block of metadata, it will stay there for as long as your mouse is there. But if you just mouse over the image itself, then after three seconds, the block disappears. And as you would imagine, you can change that number of seconds value either through text entry with your keyboard or with the plus and minus keys. So if you just want it to appear for one second and then disappear, you can set it to one. If you want it to stay for five seconds, set it to five, whatever. All right. I am going to set it back to extended overlays on mouse hover. And then we have this show tool tip. 
Now, what this does is adds not only the metadata that we see overlaid over the top of the image when we hover with the mouse, but we also get this extra grey box that has a similar array of information in it as well. And as we change images, that little tooltip grey box will follow us. Its positioning seems to be very random. <laughs> I don't know what drives its location, but it's all over the place. Um, oh, I think it's location depend. It is. It's location dependent. So if I mouse over the left side of the image, it appears on the left side. If I mouse over the right side of the image, it appears on the right. If I mouse at the bottom, right. Interesting. See, I'm learning as I go. Nice. So yeah, so you've got that text overlay that appears in a separate box when you click on the show tooltip option on that star icon. Now, even though that is switched on, we can then activate and deactivate that extra grey box of metadata with the keystroke shift T, which is show tooltips basically so shift t you'll see a little brief message appeared up at the top of the light table there that said tooltips off and you'll notice that now the tooltips are not appearing even though show tooltip is still applied there so if that happens where you have show tooltip checked but you're not seeing the tooltip appear when you mouse over an image go shift t and then you will have that information back. All right, next up, dynamic buttons. Probably the best demonstration I've seen of this is history stack. At the moment, all these buttons are grayed out because I have no images selected. If I mouse over an image, you will see that copy, copy all, compress history and discard history, load sidecar file, right sidecar file, those are all accessible now because I've got this image selected. So if I copy the entire history stack because maybe I want to paste it onto another image from the same shoot so that I get the same look, you'll notice that the paste and paste all buttons are still disabled. And the reason for that is because I'm still on the image from whence I copied all of the history stack. So it doesn't make sense to be able to paste into that image because the settings haven't changed. But if I go to another image, now paste and paste all are available. Okay, so that's what is meant by dynamic buttons. And you'll see it throughout the interface in the uh, history module in the dark room. There are certain modules you can turn off and some that you can't turn off. And, and it's just little bits and pieces like that. I'm not sure if I've already mentioned it earlier on, but things like these icons up here, they have been redesigned. And according to the documentation, they are high DPI ready. So if you do have a 4K display, and according to the documentation, it only made reference to the Windows version, which seems rather odd, given that Windows was the last operating system to see a version of Darktable. Um, so I'm not sure whether that applies also to Mac and Linux, but apparently if you do have a high DPI display, these images will scale accordingly. Okay, now I mentioned the preferences dialog box and how much of an awesome redesign it is. So let's have a look. Click on the preferences button. We now have all of these tabs down the left hand side which is a massive improvement from 3 and 3 was a massive improvement from 2.x um, and it will always default to the third tab the light table view i'm not sure why it doesn't default to general but that's the way it is so let's just have a look at what we've got here Actually, no, before we do that, I will come back to the light table view because I want to keep talking about those size categories of the thumbnails. Remember how I said there's small, medium, and large? So delimiters for sizes categories, 120, and then the pipe symbol, that's your shift key and the backslash key, and then 400. So what that means is 
any thumbnail that is less than 120 pixels wide or tall, I think, I think it just goes on the longest dimension, will be considered a small thumbnail. Anything that's between 120 pixels and 400 pixels will be a medium thumbnail. And anything that's 400 pixels or larger will be considered a large thumbnail. Now, let's just dive out and see how that gets impacted when we choose some of these different options from the thumbnail overlay setting. And you will notice thumbnail overlays for size one, presumably that is medium and size zero is small because I'm currently at 201 pixels. If I now shrink those down size zero, 63 pixels. So even though, so I have overlays on mouse hover. So when I mouse over, I just see the star ratings and that was the same for a medium sized thumbnail as well. If I now go extended overlays on mouse hover, guess what? It's there, but it's so tiny you can't read it. So it's a bit pointless. Interestingly, if we come up to the largest size of thumbnail, so we are now at size two, 402 pixels, and I've got permanent extended overlays, you'll notice that now all of that information appears outside of the image. With the medium sized thumbnail, that information there, the file name and all of the shoot metadata, tended to get overlaid over the top of the image. Whereas with large thumbnails, there's enough room for it to not be sitting over the top of your image. So that's nice. So that's what's meant by the three thumbnail sizes. And like I said, you can go in to that field and change those values if you want to. So you can have it so that a small thumbnail is everything up to 150 or on, only up to 100 pixels or whatever you like. And if you ever want to set it back to its default values and you've forgotten what they were, you can simply double click and it will go back. So if I now change that to 100 and 450, that will now change the size D limits. So that's 100 pixels. So I'm just at the bottom end of what's considered a medium size thumbnail. And if I go up to, oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Still size one at 402 pixels. But if I then go up to 597 pixels, I'm now at size two, which means I'm a large thumbnail and all of that metadata is no longer displayed over the top of my image. So yeah, so that's pretty cool. And then if you wanna set that back and you've forgotten what those values were, double click and it automatically resets to 120 and 400. So that's pretty cool. Right below that, you will notice pattern for the thumbnail extended overlay text. So, thumbnail extended overlay. As we saw, that information only pops up when I mouse over, if I've chosen on mouse hover. And that information, the file name, the file extension, and all the shoot metadata is controlled by this text string right here. So you can go in and edit either removing or adding more information from the EXIF metadata and presumably also from the, is it IPTC or ITPC, whatever that other, <laughs> the other uh, information is, presumably you could also use that information uh, and put it into that text string and that information will then show up uh, in those text uh, overlays when you mouse over an image. So that's pretty cool. And then right below that, we've got the pattern for the thumbnail tooltip. 
So that was that other option down the bottom there, show tooltip. So what appears in that gray box there, which is pretty much the same as the overlay metadata, except this includes the shoot date and the time of capture for that particular image. That information is all controlled by that text string right there. And once again, you can add or remove whatever metadata you like from that text string. And as you can see there, empty to disable. So if you wanted to have tooltips turned on all the time, but you don't want to see that extra gray box appearing beside your thumbnails when you mouse over an image, you can simply remove all of that text and then there will be no pop-up gray box as a tooltip in your thumbnail uh, displays. So I will turn that back off. All right, so moving on, back to the preferences dialog. Like I said, all these tabs, beautiful. One of the things that I've noticed, and this may be dependent upon your font size, but what I've noticed is that at the moment, other than the presets tab, none of these other tabs will have a vertical scroll bar. All the information fits on the one page. That's beautiful. Uh, the presets does have this very short scroll bar. But like I said, that may be dependent upon the font size that you're using. And whilst we're talking about that, let's jump to the general tab. And you'll notice that there is a checkbox here for use system font size. So if you've got a default font size uh, determined by your system or, or it's set as a system wide parameter, like maybe you have 10 point font as your system font uh, right across everything, you can check that box and everything will use a 10 point font if that's what your current font size is. Now, if I just double check what I was saying about no scroll bars. Yep. 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 It's only, <laughs> it's only the presets tab that's got a scroll bar. Now, I've unchecked that and chosen a manual font size. And you can either do it by entering the text with your keyboard, or you can use the plus and minus icons here to set a smaller or larger font size according to your tastes. There's also GUI controls and text DPI. Now, I suspect that this is related to people who are using 4K displays. I know that when version 3 came out last Christmas, there were some issues where people were going, what's going on with the fonts? Everything's super big or super small or whatever. So I think this control is to allow you to, you know, manually tweak the font scaling and the GUI scaling according to the DPI that you're running on your monitor. So by default, the value is minus one. If I set that to plus one, the moment I get out of my preferences, everything shrinks like so. Now, if I go back to preferences and go back to the general tab, what's interesting is I don't see plus one, I see 64. Now, I'm not sure if that's a bug or if it's because I don't really understand what the numbers that you enter there are representing. Uh, but if I type minus one, what I have noticed is that things do not revert when I exit the preferences dialog box. I need to now close Darktable and relaunch it. So that might be one of those last minute bugs that got squashed before 3.2 was released, let's hope. You'll also see that there is now this massive text entry screen here on the general tab where if you want to change the CSS theming for the entire Darktable application, you can either enter it here or you can 
you know, write it up in a text editor outside of Darktable and then simply copy and paste. And once you've pasted it in here, click on Save Theme Tweaks. And I will confess, one, I don't know CSS well enough to muck around with that stuff. And two, I don't really care for modifying the theme. I'm quite happy with the default look of Darktable. Uh, so that's not something I've ever delved into. But if you are one of those people who likes to customize the look of it, you now have this very simple way of updating the theme uh, from within the preferences dialog. And if the GUI scaling you know, and its dynamic adaptation is anything to go by, then it stands to reason that if you paste any CSS tweaks in here and you click Save Theme Tweaks, I would expect that the minute you exit the Preferences dialog box, it should update straight away, I would expect. Okay, moving on, there was nothing new in the import tab that I remember. Uh, I don't think there was anything new here that I haven't already covered. So we'll move on to the darkroom tab. Right at the bottom here, you'll see reduce resolution of preview image. Now, I think that refers to the little thumbnail that appears in the top left hand corner of the darkroom view. By default, that is set to original and you can choose to go half resolution, one third resolution, or one quarter resolution. And presumably what that will do, let's just dive into this image here, is reduce the amount of CPU requirement for drawing of this thumbnail. Now, it does say in the documentation that that particular value in preferences will uh, impact the quality of guided masks. Now, I haven't really looked into how that might affect the images, but just be aware of that. If guided masks are something you use, then, yeah, just be prepared that if you do run this at some other lesser resolution than original, the guided masks might not look as accurate as what you're used to. But I don't think that will affect the exported image. I think it's only in the, the preview. That's my understanding, at least. If we go to the Processing tab, we will see that there is this new option, Auto Apply Pixel Workflow Defaults. And there are three options here. Scene Referred, Display Referred, and None. This refers to what default modules should be applied when you import an image that has never been imported into Darktable before. If you are used to the old way of working, which is that the base curve module would be applied by default, and you want to continue with that workflow, then you want to change this to display referred. Display referred means that when you bring a new image into Darktable for the very first time, the base curve module will be applied and based on the metadata of your image, which will include the camera make and model, the relevant base curve for that model and make of camera will be applied to that image or those images. That's the old way of working. The old way simply means that base curve works in the lab color space. And Aurelien Pierre, who is one of the key developers of Darktable, has spent a lot of time developing Filmic, which is now up to version four. And Filmic is designed to work on linear RGB. Apparently that's a better way of going. I, I know I kind of wrapped my head around it so that I could do the video on Filmic version two. What was that, 12 months ago? Something like that. Um, but I really don't understand it enough. I will take him at his word when he says this is a better way of working. 
Um, and so that is why the default option now is scene referred. And with scene referred selected, whenever you import a new image into Darktable, two modules will be activated by default. Filmic V4 and Exposure. Uh, Filmic V4, which, like I said, I'll, I'll cover it briefly later in this video, uh, it's basically trying to emulate a film look for your digital images. But part of the code, and like I said, I still need to do my research on this so that I can do a video on Filmic properly, part of it requires exposure to be sort of mapped to a default value. And for some reason, which I've yet to research, it means that the exposure module will be activated and it will default to a plus 0.5 EV setting for every image. Now, like I said, I haven't looked into it. I don't know why I will try and wrap my head around it and that'll be the next video that I do. But just understand that this drop down by default will be seen referred. So all new images imported will get Filmic V4 and exposure with a plus half a stop boost. If you choose display referred, you'll be going the old route, which is to use base curve. And if you don't want either, you just want to manually tone map your entire image from scratch, then you can choose none. Next up, moving on to the storage tab, you will notice that there is a new option, check for database maintenance. Now I'm not sure what database maintenance involves, but by default, it will check the database when you close the app. Now, what I'm also not sure about is that you have the option for on start, on close, on both, but then you have on startup, don't ask, on close, don't ask, on both, don't ask. But I've never actually seen it ask me to do it, which is the default on close, right? If I close the app, I'm not seeing it ask me if I want the database management to run. It just seems to do it anyway. So what the don't ask options do differently, I really don't know. Next up, on the miscellaneous tab, there is a new section here, keyboard shortcuts with multiple instances. So this refers to if you have created a duplicate of a particular module and it's a module that you regularly use keyboard shortcuts with, how should Darktable interpret which instance of those two modules? Let's, let's say you've, for some reason, created two exposure modules because maybe you want to do some positive exposure on one part of the image, but you want to do some negative exposure on another part of the image. So you've created a, a positive exposure module and a negative exposure module. And if you've got a keyboard shortcut assigned that works with the, you know, let's say the exposure slider within that module, how should Darktable handle the, you know, the fact that there are two exposure modules and which one should it pay attention to? So obviously we can check the box that says prefer expanded instances. So that would mean that if we jump over to here, have I got any duplicate modules in here? No, I don't. Let's just create a second RGB module. It will mean that expanded simply means that, that the module is expanded and visible. So that would be the first option. Enabled instances. So if you choose this instance and you have two RGB curve modules, but we deactivate this one, then obviously if you use a keyboard shortcut that is assigned to the RGB curves module, it will go looking for the instance of the module that is actually active makes sense. Third option, prefer unmasked instances. Now, 
I'm going to assume, I haven't had time to experiment with that, but I assume it means if you've created a mask inside that particular module, then it will use the module that doesn't have any masks attached to it, I think. Don't quote me on that one. Selection order, first instance or last instance. So should it be after applying the above rules, apply the shortcut based on its position in the pixel pipe. So again, last instance would mean the one which is higher up the list of active modules because that is the order of our pixel pipe from bottom to top. If we change that to first instance, then it will be whichever of those two is closest to the bottom. In other words, first in the pixel pipe. Okay, moving on to shortcuts. You will notice down here in the bottom left, there is now a search box. So if you want to search for a particular keyboard shortcut to modify, let's say we use exposure as a demonstration, click on search and what will happen is that Darktable will then look for instances of the word exposure within all of the things that can have keyboard shortcuts applied. And you can just keep hitting search and jump through all of the available options that match that. So if you're looking for a particular keyboard shortcut, this will make it much quicker to find. Next up, this is the one thing that I haven't seen in this particular build, and maybe it was something that was added late, or maybe I just don't know what I'm looking for. But Bill, oh, Bill, my apologies, I've forgotten your surname, who does the Lua scripting, has written basically a Lua script that handles the deployment of Lua scripts. And that is also available in 3.2. Um, again, Scripting is not something that I have ever delved into, so I can't really talk about that, but apparently there is an improved handling of Lua scripting in 3.2. So if that's in your wheelhouse, you'll probably know what you're looking for and you'll probably find it for yourself. So have fun. And that is going to do it for the preferences dialog box. Let's have a look at what's changed in the light table view. All right, in the import dialog box, you will now notice if you choose import image or folder that you can choose all of these fields of metadata to be uh, applied to newly imported images on a per field basis, which is fantastic. So if you just want to include certain fields but not include other fields because I know there are people who like to do some of their metadata editing in other applications like raw therapy or digicam or whatever you might then want to import your images into Darktable and you only want to overwrite some of the fields but not all of the fields because you've already done some of that metadata entry in another application so the ability to select these fields independently is fantastic all right the collect images module this has had a bit of an overhaul as well including the addition of seven new uh, filter types uh, we've got history which allows us to search for images that have been processed versus images that have not been processed, which I would imagine does something very similar to the select module, select untouched, but I haven't actually tried that out. But yeah, so history is one of the new options. We've got module. So if you are looking for the use of a particular module within the history stack of an image. You know, you might just want to see where's every image where I used a vignette. You know, you might suddenly think vignettes are really 
gauche and out of date and everyone went overboard on them 10 years ago and I, I want to go back and visit all my images again where I went overboard with the vignette module. Yeah, <laughs> so you could do that. So you could type in there vignette and I've got a thousand and forty images where I've used the vignette module. Oh my goodness, I've got some work to do. So there we go. Next up we've got module order. This refers to the new feature that came with Darktable 3, the ability to move the module order in the pixel pipe. So if you have customized the ordering of the pixel pipe, you will be able to find those images in this module order filter. So if you do know that you went and mucked around with things and you're not happy and you think, yeah, I just want to reset everything back to legacy and start again, you can do that from here. Next up, we've got import timestamp, as you would expect. If you know when you imported some images into Darktable, but let's suppose you forgot to set which folder they imported to and now you've gone looking for those images and they're not in the folder where you thought they should be and you've gone ah where are my images gone if you remember when you imported them like if you go well hang on I know I imported them yesterday so you could go with import timestamp enter yesterday's date and then you'll be able to find those images and then you would be able to move them to the correct folder if that was what the issue was Next is change timestamp, and this refers to when an image was processed. So this is using you know, more of the metadata from the XMP sidecar file. So if you know that you processed an image last Saturday, but now you've forgotten where it was on your system, you could just enter last Saturday's date and find when you processed you know, or what images you processed on that particular day, and that would narrow down your search for the image that you've lost. Then we've got export timestamp. Again, pretty self-explanatory. If you know you exported an image on a certain day or at a certain time, but now you've misplaced that image, uh, you can use this to search for that particular day or time and uh, hopefully find the exported version. Then... Print timestamp. Again, if you know when you printed an image, uh, but you've now forgotten where that image is, you can go and use this to search for that time and date and find the version that you printed off. It should also be mentioned that in the preferences dialog box under light table, there is the option to sort film rolls by folder or by ID. Now, I think ID is what used to be the default, that when you imported a group of images, they were assigned to a film roll that corresponded to the date and time that you imported them. But now you have that option of use a folder rather than that ID. Uh, that would probably make a lot more sense to me because I do tend to import all of my images by folder. And as I've mentioned in the past, I've long been using uh, Damon Lynch's Rapid Photo Downloader simply because that gave me the option to import to a folder where Darktable had the option, but it wasn't easy because you had to go into the old session settings, I think it was called, in the old preferences dialog box, and you had to manually edit the, the string for the folder that you wanted it to go into. So this might sort of make that a little bit more intuitive. I'm not sure. Like I said, I haven't played with that yet, but interesting to note. All right, if we move on to the image information dialog box. This has been made a little shorter vertically, but it does now have a vertical scroll bar, which it never had before. So it does mean you can scroll up and down to see all of the relevant information. 
it does also include those new tags, import timestamp, change timestamp, export timestamp, print timestamp. So if I select this image, I can see it was imported Monday, 27th of January of this year. It was last changed two days ago on the 6th of August, uh, and it has not been exported since it was last changed, nor has it been printed. So yeah, some pretty cool metadata now appearing in that information module or at least additional information. It was always handy, but now there's even more information there, so that's pretty cool. Next up, the metadata editor. This has got some new fields, notes and version name. Now, the version name is really handy if you are working with multiple instances of an image. So if I was to go to this image and decide yeah, I like this image. I want to post it to my Instagram. And as I've mentioned before, I like to post to my Instagram in a square format. That way, if I want to use a an aspect ratio that Instagram doesn't support, by fitting it inside a square frame, uh, I can have any aspect ratio I like. And so I might go to my duplicate manager and I'll go, I want to create a duplicate of this particular image. And now I want to add my framing and I'm going to go with my, oh, yeah, I don't have my preset in here. So there's my Instagram frame. So what I can do now is go store new preset call that Instagram, click on OK. Now I can go back to the image that I want to export. Go back to here. I've now got two instances of this image. I can go to this one. I can go to my frames. I can select Instagram. And now I've got my frame set up for my Instagram uh, version of this image. What I can do is within the metadata editor, I might say Instagram as a version name. And so that way, if I ever wanted to have a look at my entire library and see which images I've exported and put on my Instagram feed, because I don't want to republish an image I've already published, I could go to collect images I could go to version name, which is also a new field there, and I can choose Instagram, and there's 40 of the images that I have already tagged with Instagram in that version name field. So I know, okay, those are all images I've already put on my Instagram feed, so I know not to duplicate what I publish to my Instagram feed. That's just one way of using that version name field. You could probably find a multitude of other ways to use that information, but for me, that's just one logical use of it. It's also worth noting that the notes and version name fields also appear on the import dialog box. So you'll see that we've got the option to include notes and version name here. So you might want to use that for a, you know maybe a client shoot or who knows. Like I said, there's probably a, a million ways you could think of using that information, but it's good to know that it's there and can be applied at the time of import if you want to. Also, in the notes field and the version name field, you can have, actually it might be all fields. If you control enter, yeah, it's all fields. Using control and enter, you can have multi-line entries now where that used to only be a single line per field within the metadata editor. So yeah, if you want multiple lines of information, use control enter. Also, in the bottom right-hand corner, there is this little cog, and that will bring up this window for your different metadata fields, and you have the option for hidden or private. Hidden, 
I'm not 100% certain, but I think it just hides that field within Darktable. What the point of that is, I'm not entirely sure. Private, if you set any of these fields to private, it means that when you export a developed version of an image and you choose to export the metadata that is you know, traveling alongside that image, any fields here that you have chosen to be private, those fields will be excluded in the metadata of the exported image. So that's pretty cool. So if you do want to leave certain information out, uh, then you simply mark those as private fields and they won't be included in the export. Moving on to tagging. The tagging module now allows you to create a new tag without having an image selected. So I've got no images selected here at the moment and I want to create a new tag called board and I can simply click new and that has now been created but it is not assigned to any image. Next, I can choose this image because she looks bored. She's standing there waiting for a train that's never coming. And I can right click on this tag and there is now this pop up with all these entries. Attach the tag, detach the tag if it's already attached to an image and you don't want it. Delete the tag if we no longer want the tag. Delete the path. I'm not sure what the path refers to. Uh, create a new tag, which we'll look at in a sec. Edit the tag, copy to entry. So we will go attach tag. So now board, as we can see over here, is now one of the tags attached to this image. Okay, if we right click and go create tag, that will allow us to create a nested tag. So we can now, uh, we'll just call this board two, and you can see that we've got add to board, which means make this a sub tag under this parent tag. So that's pretty cool. Again, you can choose to make certain tags private if you don't ever want them exported when you do your exports. Uh, and you can choose categories. I'm, I'm not quite sure what categories refers to now. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, but there is also the option to include synonyms, which I think is pretty cool. So, you know, you might put a tag of water, but you might then use synonyms of ocean, lake, river, stream, brook, whatever. I don't know. There, again, there's probably a hundred different ways you might choose to use synonyms, but I think it's a nice addition to the metadata functionality of Darktable. Down in the bottom right hand corner, we've got this little icon here, which can toggle between the list and the tree view. So like so, we have got a tree view where anything with the little white triangle pointing to the right, that will allow us to expand that and see any nested tags which appear under that particular type of uh, tag. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then toggling the other way just gives you a complete list where you don't have that option to expand and where you do have nested tags, they appear like so. I love that we now have this nested view. I think it's great. Uh, particularly for things like, I think I mentioned this in a previous video where I am quite manic with my location metadata, being able to, you know, create these nested tags means that I can actually see what the very last entry is, where when you don't have that nested view, you could only see a certain number of characters and you couldn't see what the tail end of the tag actually said. So this nested view means that I can actually see the very last child tag of a string of parent tags. So that's pretty cool. 
There's also this plus icon which says toggle list with or without suggestion. I'm not entirely sure what that is doing. Uh, so I'll address that later if I ever come up with an answer for it. And the last thing to note is that when you have edited tags, apparently you used to have to restart the app for edited tag changes to be registered within the app. Uh, things, I don't know if it, if it meant creating a new tag. I think it was just about taking an existing tag and editing it. Those changes were not reflected dynamically, and you used to have to close the app and relaunch it for those changes to be recognized. Now they just happen dynamically. Next up, the export dialog box now has an option that if you are exporting as a TIFF and you are exporting a black and white image, you now have this option to either write that black and white image out using RGB colors or to write it out as grayscale. What difference that makes? Not 100% certain. I would imagine it would end up with smaller file sizes if you write it out as grayscale because in theory you've only got to record black and white pixels, uh, but I'm not 100% certain on that either. But just note that if you're exporting as a TIFF, any monochrome images, you now have that option to either go RGB or grayscale. Moving on to the styles module. What has now been included in this is the ability to create your styles or apply your styles either as an append or an overwrite. So if you've watched my video on creating styles, you will understand that it relates to the use of certain modules within the development stack. Uh, and you can create a style based on a single module or a string of modules and, and call that a given style. Now, if you want to apply those styles, you can either leave it in append mode, which means leave the existing history stack of you know, this particular image, but now add whatever modules are included in that preset style to the existing history stack, or you can choose that to be overwrite and that will replace the existing history stack of this image and replace it with whatever modules are saved in the preset. All right, let's move on to the darkroom, shall we? In the snapshots module, you will notice now when you take a snapshot and let's just disable that frame so we have something to compare it to. If I now go back to that particular snapshot, a few things have changed. One, we now have this little flag with an S on it. That is there to remind you which half of the image, and that can either be vertically or horizontally, depending on you clicking on this little circular arrow in the middle, which half of the image is the snapshot and which half of the image is the current history state. So you'll notice as it moves around, it's always pointing to the snapshot like so. So that's pretty cool. You'll also notice the color of the line. This can now be changed via this new icon in the bottom right hand corner with the little green and red uh, sort of hatch indication. Click on that and you can change overlay color to any of these six colors right here. So gray is the default. I've set mine to cyan. Uh, tends to make it visible in 99% of cases. So uh, yeah, I like it. The histogram uh, now has the ability to display a parade style histogram. For anyone who's worked in video, you might be familiar with this from your scopes. Again, like normal histograms, it starts off by showing all 
color channels overlaid together, but you can click the icon to the right of that and that will give you a parade view on a per channel basis. So that's one new addition. The other is that you can use the control key and your scroll wheel to change the height of the histogram module, like so. Not a massive amount of change, but you can at least make it a little smaller if you want more screen real estate down the right hand side, or make it higher if you want a little bit more accuracy. As previously mentioned, we've got two new modules added to Darktable 3.2. They are Filmic V4 and Negadoctor. Now, if you're thinking, hang on, I don't remember there being a Filmic V3, because I don't think it actually saw the light of day. I know Darktable 3 had Filmic V2, I'm not sure if Aurelian ever actually got Filmic V3 into a stable release. Um, yeah, but anyway, it's, it's now at version 4. And what it is designed to do is to mimic the look of film by default, as I said. So if I was to just jump back to white balance here, that's pretty much the imported image uh, with the exception of a slight white balance tweak. If I now include Filmic RGB, it looks like so. And if I was to also add the half stop of exposure that um, is meant to go along with Filmic RGB, that's where we would get to. That's probably not too far off what the in-camera JPEG would have looked like. It's probably a little bit too warm for my liking. I could go through and tweak that. But basically, Filmic is there to try and mimic the look of analog film. As previously mentioned, it desaturates uh, pixels as they go towards white and towards black. Uh, and like I said, I need to do a lot of research before I can talk, you know, authoritatively on what it's doing. Even after doing research, I probably can't talk authoritatively on, on it, but I will do my best to wrap my head around it. And like I said, that will hopefully be the next video that I do. The other new module is Negadoctor. Now, I don't have a film scanner uh, with which to demonstrate, but what the Negadoctor module is designed to do is to allow you to scan from pieces of film and use this color bar to choose the base color of the film strip so as to turn your negatives into positives. Uh, from the notes that came out with 3.2, they said, you know, you can try doing it with a home scanner, but they generally don't scan at a particularly high resolution. And if you've got a proper film scanner, they tend to be very slow and they're very expensive. But uh, the suggestion is, is that if you have a macro lens, then you could potentially re-photograph your negs, bring them into Darktable as a negative, and then use Negadoctor to interpret the film base to then create an inverse of what you've photographed as a negative. Again, I don't have the proper equipment to demonstrate this, and I haven't yet done enough research on all of the parameters inside the module, and that will be on my homework list for the next couple of weeks to, uh, to get on top of that. And I might have to reach out to the community for a sample image that I can then use for that uh, video. If you're watching this and you do have a high quality photograph of a neg that I could potentially use, please reach out to me and let me know because, like I said, I don't have the facilities to do it. I do have a macro lens that I can use with my A850. I suppose I could try and do something, but if anyone else has got one, please let me know. That'd be awesome. 
Next up, masks. I just went and dug out another image because I needed something specific to demonstrate. We now have the ability to create a curved graduated density mask. Okay, so previously, if you wanted to create a graduated density mask, the only thing you could do with it was create a straight line, right? Like so. And you could then rotate this to any way you wanted. And you would use the shift wheel to create the fall off of that uh, filter. So let's suppose I wanted to darken that background like so, but I really would like it to wrap around her face a little bit. So now I can mouse over the line which represents the graduated filter and using my mouse wheel, I can now bend that graduated density filter. How sweet is that? And you could then, you know, customize its position according to the curve of her face. And yeah, that's really sweet. I like that. I can also imagine if you were let's say shooting landscapes with a wide angle lens where you, I, sh I should probably say seascapes, you know, where you've got a very definite horizon, but if you're shooting it with a wide angle lens and you don't have the horizon at exactly the midpoint vertically of the composition, then, you know, the horizon will end up being you know, the ocean will be curved like that if it's below the midline of the frame and it'll be curved that way if it's above the midline of the frame. I could imagine that being able to do this curved graduated density filter is going to come in very handy for shots like that where you might want to tone down the brightness of the sky or conversely lighten the darkness of the land or the ocean in the lower half of the composition. So yeah, so that's a nice new tweak. Along with that, you can use the control key. If we just turn on that mask, if you hold down your control key and then mouse wheel, you can control the opacity of the mask. And if you hold down the shift key and use the mouse, as you know, you can change the edge hardness of that so i mean that's that's not new that's always been the case in fact i think the control modifier has as well now that i think about it but yeah that's cool curved graduated density masks and it's just simply by using your mouse wheel over that control line and i think if you're working on a laptop where you've only got a trackpad I think there's a keystroke that you can use with your trackpad, but I'm not entirely sure what that is. Uh, if you do know, sing out in the comments down below. Thank you. All right, we're getting towards the tail end now. Also added in Darktable 3.2, in the darkroom view, down in the bottom right-hand corner, a new button here that says Module Order. And if we expand that, we can see that the current order is Legacy. What that means is that the pixel pipe order, remember whenever you're looking at this active modules tab, this is the actual order of the pixel pipe, right? From starting point at the bottom to final output at the top. That is the default order of those modules as it has always been in Darktable. And as you will recall from December 2019, when Darktable 3 came out, what we got was the ability to alter that default pixel pipe order. In other words, the order in which the modules are applied. Now, as I said at the time, unless you know what you're doing and why you are doing it, I highly recommend that you just don't. Even I don't know why you would want to change the default order, but, you know, maybe you have a reason. So, let's suppose I want to change 
I'm going to bring the color correction down below RGB curve, for example. So control, shift, grab the module, and I can then just drop it where I want it. So it has now been changed, and we can now see that our current order says custom. And it is exactly that. I've customized the order. Now, from within this button, we have our regular hamburger for presets. I can click on store new preset and go Bruce 01, because I have no other reason for why I would save this or what I might call it. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell me that that is the name of the preset. It still says custom. But you'll also notice that from that pop-up, you can also go back to the legacy order if you want to, or the version 3.0, which is the default. Uh, so if you know that you've messed around with the order of the modules, but you can't remember where they were by default, it's very easy to just choose version 3.0 default from this menu and they then jump back to their default positions in the pixel pipe. And the last one, the film strip, which we can access with control F as you already know, now defaults to a single click change. I love this. So just a single click and it will change to whatever image you choose. I love that. That is fantastic. Nice work, devs. Love your work. I'm going to throw in one final thing that I, I don't think this is a new feature. It's just something that I discovered as I was doing my research for this particular episode. And it was that the graduated density filter, the slider that used to be called compression is now called hardness. I don't know when that changed, but I'm fairly certain that when I did the video on graduated density, that was called compression. And it was all about, you know, how does the compression of the graduated filter relate to the size of the composition? You know, so if you had it at 100%, it basically graduated over the entirety of the height or the width of the frame, depending on which way you were running the graduated filter. Uh, but now it's called hardness. So yeah, so somewhere along the line that changed. But anyway, call that a bonus. Alrighty, so that, <laughs> my friends, is Darktable 3.2. There's a hell of a lot to take in. I realize it's taken me many days to put this together. Uh, like I said, I, I sat down and I must have spent probably four hours writing up just the notes that I used to then sit down and record this video. And it's probably taken me a good, where did I start? I was, I was at 141 and it's now, it's almost 340. So it's taken me almost two hours to shoot all of the content <laughs> for this video. Now I've got to go and edit it. Uh, thankfully, the edited version won't run two hours. Uh, but I imagine this is going to be a big video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been educational. I hope you enjoy some of the new features because I know I am absolutely loving where Darktable is going. I really am. For software that you don't have to pay for, holy crap, this has to be the benchmark. It is just beautiful. So devs, if I had a hat, I would take my hat off to you. Uh, nice work. Um, Aurelian, I will do my best not to butcher the video for Filmic V4. Um, I'm probably going to have to send him an email and get him to explain a couple of things to me. Uh, but it will be my aim to make the next two videos, Filmic V4 and Neg Doctor. And like I said, if anyone's got a good quality Neg capture that I could use for the Neg Doctor video, uh, please reach out. I'd be happy to use a well-produced 
neg file for that video if I can get one. Alrighty, I think that pretty much does it. I'll catch you in the next one.